just to to introduce you. Um, so thank you very much for accepting accepting being our guest today, Joel. Uh, so Joel, uh, you're Joel Niklos, you're a PhD candidate at the University of Bern. You're also visiting scholar at Stanford. You're a computer scientist, expert in um, artificial intelligence and particularly uh, NLP applied to law. So this is a, a great honor to have you today. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, for being our guest today. Thanks very much for the inv invitation. It's a great pleasure. So before maybe we start uh, directly to to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and law, maybe we can we can discover a little bit of your path. Um, how did you commit into studying computer science and 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 why apply to 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 law? And was it something you already were you were curious uh, younger? At, the, at high school or even at the at the university how, how was your journey b before becoming the, the the expert you are now um yeah i i studied um in in high school mostly languages um and then i did a test to to find out what i want to study at the university level which put sports science and computer science at the top which is what i went on to do and then during my bachelor's and master's, I got really interested in, in machine learning and AI. And that's where I uh, took many courses and did my bachelor's and master's thesis in. So I, I developed an, an artificial intelligence for the Swiss card game Yas. Mm. And then for, for the PhD, I, I joined a position where we have a collaboration with lawyers from the University of Bern so that's when I got into legal NLP. Um, so uh, you were already very, uh, uh, I mean, uh, computer uh, in, interested in computer science. Or uh, how did you how did you get so so passionate about uh, you know code uh, coding and and developing uh, programs and and then ending into into the artificial intelligence world maybe you could have done uh, other other scientific study maybe biology maybe physics but why uh, but why um, but why particularly computer science um in high school i i did a sorry yes uh, uh, I think there is some delay. Um, yeah, at, at in high school, I developed a, a website for um, for matching students with teachers for uh, for subjects where they are a bit weak. Um, and I really liked the process of building a website. And in computer science, in my opinion, it can be very creative, and um, you can build lots of stuff very fast and it can reach many people and that's what i really liked about it so also during the studies i developed uh, lots of software for for clients my myself uh, but i also worked as a, as a web developer for a company where we developed uh, front end for for customers and that's what i that's what i like about computer science and then uh, machine learning or ai goes a, st a step further and enables applications that are not possible with standard software. Um, so you can also like classify images or handle text, which would be difficult otherwise with just regular code. So, so the computer science uh, field was a, a way for you to express your your creativity and your 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 your, um, your imagination and to to develop uh, tools. That uh, uh, not other field could, could have offered you, right? Uh, this is something uh, many, many, many computer scientists told me that the computer science is a fascinating field that uh, enabled them to you know to express their full potential and their full uh, imagination uh, to to develop tools uh, and tools useful for the humankind. So this is, uh, I mean, your I guess your 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 path also, right? Yeah, exactly. Another thing that I find really exciting is that you can build something here in Switzerland and anyone can use it worldwide without any obstacles or like with only minor obstacles uh, in comparison to when you build something physical, which you have to ship and um, replicate 
which is expensive. Okay, so I am trying to 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 get back my course, but uh, if uh, if there is still technical issue, maybe we could uh, we could uh, uh, transition uh, to to your presentation. So you 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 entered a PhD uh, program to become a, so PhD in computer science, and how was your 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 thought, you know, or your your, um, your opportunity to join a PhD program because you could have just after the master, you know, join a company and become engineer. Uh, so why why did you come into research in particular and, and why in the in the field you are now? Yeah, great question. Thanks. Um, so I really like the process of uh, doing the final thesis already in high school, but then in, during the bachelor's and the master's as well, because that's where you can really do what you like. In normal university courses, you're always kind of constrained by what the, the professor or the teacher um, assigns you to do. But then in the final project, you, it's you who can decide what you want to do. And that's something I really liked. And then I maybe sort of naively thought that in the PhD, it's going to continue the same way, which was sort of true, but just yeah, on steroids, I guess. So you have also uh, visited uh, Stanford, Stanford as a visiting scholar, right? Yeah, exactly. I just came back in the end of March. So how was it uh, uh, emulating, with, uh, seeing other other uh, way of working or same thing everywhere? <laughs> no, it was quite different to where I'm doing my PhD currently. Um, it's just very much bigger. Um, so in at Stanford, there are like 50 PhD students in NLP only, and uh, at home I'm I'm just by myself. So it's uh, it's great to to be able to talk to so many people that are interested in, interested interested in the same field. Um, yeah, they're they're all very high energy and uh, very excited about the things they're doing. So it was a great time to be there. Fantastic. So, Joel, you you prepared us uh, something to show, right? Uh, if you can, if if you wish, you can share the screen. You have the, you should have the bottom uh, in your in your. On, you have it or not? Just to. Um, if you don't yeah. have the bottom, maybe you can send me the the presentation. I will share it for you. Uh, because we have two interfaces here with this app. Uh, one is the host and co-host. We have more uh, uh, more button, you know, more more buttons to to as a feature and for and the guest side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think I can share. Yes, just one moment. Um, Um, can you see it? Uh, let me check. No, I, I don't see it. You don't? Um, hmm. Um, yeah, let me try again. Can you see now? Uh, no, no, I don't see your presentation. You have the the share share screen button in your in your interface. Yeah, for for me it says uh, you're sharing the screen, but I don't know why it uh, it does that. I can. Um... 
man. I'm not allowed to send messages here. Uh, you can send me a message by um, uh, now. Yeah, by LinkedIn. Does it work? Um, I sent I sent it to you. Oh, great! So I will. Sorry, everyone, for all for all, all of these uh, technical issue. It's always the case when we have a live with the with the with LinkedIn. Okay, I should. It's it's trying to to upload it. It should start in a, in a few seconds. Okay. Processing, processing, we have, okay. What is the slide deck? It's incredible. Ah, hallelujah. <laughs> Great. Can I start? Yes, sure, please. Great. Yeah, so I'm presenting um, work that I did in the past year and a half. So it's uh, about um, data sets for, for um, the legal domain, both for evaluating and pre-training uh, legal language models. And would you mind going to the next slide, please? Yeah, so the first, Work is um, is a pre-training data set, a large corpus. A preprint is coming soon. It's trying to work with uh, Veton Matthias from the Bern University of Applied Sciences, Ilias from University of Copenhagen, and Daniel from Stanford. And then the next um, part is about Lextreme, which is um, a benchmark for evaluating the language models that we pre-trained. And this is joint work with uh, Beton, Pucha, Andrea, Matthias, and Ilias. So why should we create Lextreme? So as you might know, language models have made huge progress in recent years. So many, many benchmarks are saturated by now. Um, and Another problem is that most benchmarks are for the English language only and often only for newspaper and Wikipedia data. So multilingual and domain specific benchmarks are very rare. Um, and that's what we try to fix with Lextreme. So how do we compare to other benchmarks? Um, there are some legal benchmarks. There, um, there are some um, benchmarks for non-English languages as well, also for multilingual language uh, for multilingual domain, um, and we combine these uh, aspects. So our work is uh, multitask, multilingual, and for a specific domain, the law. Um, let's skip over this. I think this this might be interesting for a discussion later, maybe. So just quick, just to quickly mention what's in there in the data set, we have um, on the right side, we see the jurisdictions that are present. So we see Brazil, Germany, Greece, Switzerland, and then the EU. 
and some others as well. So it's quite diverse and it covers the 24 EU languages. And then on the left side, you can see that the, the, different, um, the different parts that are present in the data set. We have, we have multiple um, subsets for each data set. And then we see the, the number of labels. Let's, let's go on. So just uh, please, sorry to interrupt you, just to introduce my co-host is uh, Dr. Benjamin Del Sol. He's a quantum physicist and also an, an European uh, uh, IP attorney. Hello, Benjamin. Thanks for Hello. joining Hello. No, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Pleasure. Great. Then uh, we, we compare five, five multilingual models on our data set to, to see how they fare on the, on the, in the legal domain. Let's continue, please. Yes, so you can see the XLMR, XLMR large model performs the best. As you can see on the right, the aggregate score is the highest and the aggregate scores um, increase um, linearly with the, or in, increase with the number of parameters as they increase as well. So on the top is the smallest model and on the in the bottom, the largest model. There are some, some uh, outliers with the German argument mining and the Greek legal code data sets in the um, third and fourth row. But otherwise, this uh, finding holds quite well. Next slide, please. Then when we compare the, the models on the languages, we see as well that uh, the large model performs the best. But there on the right side, you can see one exception, namely that the MD Berta model seems to be more robust uh, across languages um, than the XLMR model, even though the XLMR model is better on the, on the data sets. So what we did here is we want we wanted to be as fair towards as many languages as possible. So that's why we introduced this score as well to measure um, the robustness of the models across all languages. So here, each language is, is weighted the same in contrast to before where um, the, the languages that have more samples are weighted higher. We can see in the, in the last row that the native BERT, which is a monolingual model for each of the languages, uh, performs better than the, the large models in um, Czech and in Greek which uh, could be the case because of a special tokenizer there and more capacity that can be allocated to, to these special scripts and symbols that are present in these languages. Thanks. Um, then what we do here is we compare the models based on both the language aggregate score and the dataset aggregate score and um, we compute the final extreme score, which you can see below the, the name of the model. And um, yes, as you can see, the, it, there is quite a, a standard increase in, in terms of um, extreme score based on the model size. Next slide, please. Thanks. So what we, what we did is we selected 11 out of 108 um, data sets to create the first multilingual legal benchmark. Then we established point, a point of reference with five multilingual models on our new data set. And then maybe we, if we have time for a short discussion, that could be um, now, or otherwise I would continue with the multilingual, multilegal pilot. No, we can accept. Uh... So why why should we create the multilegal pile additionally? So as you might know, the large language models need huge amounts of data to, to be pre-trained on. Um, so the Llama model recently was trained on 1.4 trillion tokens. But here again, we have the problem that most corpora are English only and here predominantly based on web crawls because that's just where you find um, most data in, the, in an easy way. So 
As well here, high quality multilingual and domain specific corpora are rare. And that's what we do here with the multilegal pile. So the multilegal pile, it consists of four parts, namely uh, Urlex resources, which are different text types from um, the Urlex database present in 24 EU languages. Then we have the native multilegal pile, which consists of case law and legislation uh, from jurisdictions in 14 EU languages that we put together. And then we filtered uh, a web crawl data set um, for legal citations in, the, in these 24 EU languages to create legal MC4. And finally, we include a large um, English data set, mainly from the US, from a colleague of mine into the, the multilingual data set. Then here we can see the distribution across text types and languages of our corpus. And as you can see, it's case law. So um, court rulings dominate with a little over 50%. And then we see legislation and contracts. Other two big types are quite small in comparison, um, even though probably contracts are a very large part in existence of um, of the of the legal uh, text in in total, but often they're not public. That's why we cannot include them here. Then the legal MC4 is also around fifteen percent, and anything that doesn't fit into these categories is termed other. Then regarding the languages, you can see that. Also, again, here, English dominates quite by a bit. So we're still at over 50% English data, but compared to other data sets where the English portion is over 90%, often even over 95 or 99%, we have lots of Portuguese data, for example, and then also lots of data in the Swiss languages, German, French, Italian, and also Spanish. So what we did is we trained um, our legal models on this data and evaluated it on Lextream and LexGlue afterwards. As you can see, we have uh, um, a base and large size multilingual model that is based on the XLMR that you can see above. So we continue pre-training this for 1 million steps in the base size version and 500,000 steps in the large version. Then we continue training it on long documents to create a long former version that makes it more, much easier to, to look at um, documents that are longer. That's up until 4,000 tokens. So probably around like eight pages. And then we have monolingual models as well. So trained on just one language. So what do we get when we actually evaluate our new models now on the benchmark that we introduced before? So as you can see on the in the last row, the, the first box, the top box in the aggregate column, the XLMR large, which has like three times the parameters than the base size model is more or less performing equally well. So you can have a smaller model when you pre-train it in domain, it's, it approaches the, the performance of a much larger model. If we scale up the parameter size, of course, we also outperform the large model. Um, then surprisingly, the long former model performs even better, even though it's only the base size model. So especially for the, the four tasks on the left, um, you can see that it, um, it arrives at the highest scoring number. Interestingly as well, on the four tasks on the, on the right, um, our models don't perform as well. These are all named entity recognition tasks. Um, and it's an open question why, why there they perform a bit worse. Next slide, thanks. And then we also evaluated on LexGlue, which is an English only benchmark. 
And there we also compare the, the monolingual models that you can see in the box on the left side. They're trained on, on only English data. And there we can see that these models outperform the multilingual ones um, because they were not trained on, uh, on other languages, but could just focus on English, especially on um, the first three tasks, the large model performs the best and in aggregate as well. Here on LETGAR and uh, unfair terms of service, the, the two columns with the, the large box on the right, um, they, perf they don't perform as well, which is um, probably the case because they were not trained a lot on contracts. Um, as you have seen before in the distribution of text types, we were ma mainly training on case law and these these uh, benchmarks, these data sets where we evaluate it are based on contracts. So to conclude, we created a very large, diverse and domain specific pre-training corpus. Then we trained several models and finally they were able to beat the state of the art in LexGlue and LexStream and in, as well in some, some tasks specifically. Thanks. This is the last one? Yes. yes. Okay, so I will I have a, uh, a screen. Okay, I'm trying to to cut the, the sharing. Uh, why it doesn't work? <laughs> this app is uh, is wonderful because now I I can't uh, I can't. Uh, why I can't cut the. Later. Okay, let, let's let's keep it uh, like that because I, I, I can't uh, remove uh, the slide. So thank you very much, Joel. Uh, it was a little bit technical, but I think um, Benjamin, uh, for you, it was uh, it was easy to understand. I'm a biologist by training, so for me, maybe it it, it, it is a little, a little bit uh, um, harder. Benjamin, do you have some question? I will check the, the chat. Uh, on LinkedIn to see if there are people who have uh, questions. I, I think you're on mute, no? Right, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, no, so so Joel, um, congratulations because it's a, it's a very uh, huge work that you, you have done and that you are doing uh, again. But um, it's, it's really interesting uh, because as you said, um, all of the large model uh, language model right now are mainly based on English database and for sure in the legal field, because each language has its own way to, 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 to yeah, its own words uh, in the legal field. It's really, really important. And I think uh, the work you are doing will be very valuable uh, for people like me and all the legal field in general um so yes congratulations <laughs> and so if i understand well what you said is that at the end it's more than based on i mean it's not a large model or a small model but it's mainly how you train it that gives the best results right yeah exactly yeah it it depends on um like of course if you have a larger model it will be better but um, at, in some cases, you don't really want a large model because it's more expensive to run and more yeah, complicated yeah. to run. So it might be nice to have a smaller model. Yeah. And there we can see nicely that when you actually train on the right data, you can get the same performance as if you would have used a larger yes. model. And one question. So do you think, I think it's, it's an, an important Point, but do you think that the number of tokens that can be that can be uh, taken by the model uh, change a lot for the the result? Uh, sorry, how do you? Yes, uh, I, I read that uh, the models don't use the same number of tokens, 
uh, for the context part. So uh, do you think that if you increase the number of tokens, you get better re results or not? Um, I guess it depends on the downstream evaluation that you're doing. So um, some tasks that we evaluated on, they require, or their texts are just much longer. They're yeah. like around 4,000 tokens. Um, so obviously if you can, if you can look at the entire text, you're, you're expected to perform better than if you just look at the 500 yeah. first um, yes. tokens. So yeah, I think this is a very important um, part that um, that current models still are lacking a bit and that where we'll probably also see a lot of improvement in uh, uh, in coming month yeah sure and one last question um how did you process the all these legal uh, data i mean uh, did you make some summaries for each uh, documents and you get a, a vector space where you will point uh, on uh, something uh, i think you see what i mean <laughs> uh, so how did you process all these uh, amounts of text because you are limited in the number of tokens mm -hmm. yeah yeah so we we um used something called a hierarchical transformer so what we did is we chunked the text up into okay. into a um, uh, fixed amount of um, chunks which are 128 tokens long i think and then um, we embed each of those chunks and then have another transform on top yeah. which yeah and uh, one another question um because you have a fixed number of tokens for the, for these chunks are you sure that it's because i understand if i understand well you will cut in the middle for example a same uh, a paragraph a full paragraph will be cut in several chunks Yes. yes. So, so you you can lose yeah, a lose part of the of the yeah the comprehension of the the paragraph it's in himself. So, is there a way that you could think to avoid this <clears throat> this problem? I mean, to not cut in the middle of a phrase at least. Yeah, that's a great question. That's also something we wondered about. But then a colleague of mine, Ilias, did did a paper on this, uh, where he showed that it doesn't really matter. Surprisingly whether okay. you chunk like just in fixed um lengths yeah. of 100 tokens or whether you use the paragraph information uh, to okay chunk. Yeah, very interesting which was surprising to me as well yeah yeah quite surprising now, i say that because i'm training myself some artificial intelligence on ip that the legal database um, to serve as a ai paralegal uh, in ip field and so i, I was quite um, cautious with how I design my database. Uh, but if I understand well, I, I don't have to, to cut myself, not myself, but I don't have to, to be so much detail in the chunking part of this paragraph at the end. I mean, I, I don't know how it is for information retrieval or, or tasks like this. Um, so we're just looking at uh, text classification here. Yes. Um, okay. I see. Yeah. So for so maybe for information retrieval, it would yes, it's more, more sense for information to have a paragraph yeah. level splitting. Yeah. 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 But it could be interesting to see the difference. Uh, yeah. Okay. No, it's okay. I don't have any more questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joel. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, guys. If you allow, if you allow me, I would like to ask some uh, naive or let's say more pop questions. Uh, uh, and the discussion is for both of you. Uh, I, I try to imagine myself to be a, a lawyer, so I put the, the suite of a lawyer or even of a judge uh, and who is completely ignorant about uh, artificial intelligence and all of this. My first question, you know, is uh, I always heard that, uh, you know, uh, the civil law in the Latin world country and the common law in the Anglo-Saxon world is like oil and water, you know, it cannot mix. But what I discovered with, with artificial intelligence is that you guys, you can you can literally uh, uh, dig into all this data from the civil law world and the, from the common law world. Is it is it true, or, or there is there is some kind of difference? That you have to 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 be cautious. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm I can just answer this question from the the point of a computer scientist. Uh, the point of a lawyer of I, I I obviously can't make, but it's a it's an interesting point that we wondered about a lot as well. 
and uh, I actually have um, prior work um, that was published a year ago, uh, approximately, uh, where we where we looked at the, the task of judgment prediction. So where we investigate whether, based on the facts of a legal case, can you determine what the judge would have ruled. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we we um, tested the models on the Swiss data. Um, and it turns out that like when you train on the entire data, like in German, French, and Italian, it performs better than if you just train, train on, on German, which mm. is, is um, basically known in the field, but we just um, corroborated the finding for legal text. But then what we, we went on was to, to test whether um, training additionally on more data from another jurisdiction would increase the results. And normally you would think, why would it? Because the, the jurisdiction is totally different. So we took the Indian jurisdiction. Um, we had the sim similar task. It was just the facts as input and the output was whether the case was dismissed or approved by the judge. And in India, correct me if, I'm, if I don't um, say this entirely correctly, but as far as I understood it, they're more based on common law since they're yes. uh, a previous colony of the UK um, than in Switzerland where we're more civil law based. Mm. Um, so um, it's even more surprising that what we found in the end was that it actually helped the, uh, the performance. So we, we got like 1% okay. better results when we trained additionally on the Indian data. Okay. Impressive. It's really yeah. impressive. Go, go ahead, please. No, no, I, I'm thinking why indeed, because it's quite surprising. Well, it can be su surprising. Um, probably because the way that the model work at the end in order to, to evaluate the output uh, will be more, will be the same, I think. So the, the model itself will be agnostic from uh, the jurisdiction, I think, because it's only the way that it will process the input and to, to decide the output at the end. So um, if you give the output of the uh, based on, on the case based on the common law or a civil law at the end, it doesn't change anything because the process is the same. Yes. What do you think, Joy? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, if if there is no correlation between the the input and the output, obviously it cannot learn anything. And like, if if the if the input of the Indian cases somehow contradicts the way it learned uh, to map the input from the the Swiss cases to the output, then it would um, it should yeah, it make the model worse. Yeah. But uh, that since this uh, doesn't seem to be the case and it actually improves it, yeah. it seems that um, that yeah some some property in the data seems to be similar between the Indian cases and yeah. the Swiss cases, even though it's a different legal system. Yes, because at the end, I think uh, the um, the bases are the same. The I mean the the, val uh, the values. Uh, to be considered uh, by the judge are the same. So even if it's not the same data uh, or the same law, uh, the way that the judge will think, in a way, is the same. And this is what we are asked to the model, to think like a judge. So it, just, it will be the same uh, way to think. Mm. Mm. I, have yeah. also, I have also a question about uh, uh, you know, the, the interoperability of all your research, you know, between you and OpenAI and other guys who are working on legal tech with AI, uh, is there some kind of interoperability or do you all, each, each guy's uh, work, you know, in its, 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 in its own silo, you know, and uh, they develop their own solution and, and how does it work in the, both in the scientific research, it's, it's more open, I know, but off, and also in the, in the, in the tech scene. Well, OpenAI is not very, very generous with sharing what they're doing anymore, <laughs> as you, as you probably know. Um, but we, as academics, we try to be the opposite. We try to be as open as possible. So whenever we can, we publish the entire data set. Uh, we publish the code. We publish the models. 
um, so that future researchers may may build on it and um, do additional experiments, replicate the results. Um, yeah, so we we try to be as interoperable as possible. Um, yeah, OpenAI is more on the side of yeah make money with it, uh, which is fair. Um, but yeah, it's it's difficult to to um, to be interoperable with them in the same in the same way. It's they they just as you know they they make their models available via an API, but we don't know any details about them. Mm. And concerning the 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 use the use of artificial intelligence by the end user, the lawyer, I try to to look at YouTube what, what was the case and how lawyer who have YouTube channel defend uh, IE and how they use it. I see you they use chat GTP for example to to write uh, rapid rap quickly a defense for a for a client. Uh, I have a client who was who was drunk. He he hit a car and etc. etc. Write me a defense. And blah 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 blah. Chat GTP write the defense. So it's 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 it, uh, it's very helpful because they they can they can work very faster. Uh, and uh, my, my my question here is. Um, Okay, this is with ChatGTP, but what, how how can can we see the, the the future of of uh, of both defense and 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 prosecution? You know, in in the in with with artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's a great question, and um, <laughs> it's a difficult one to answer. Um, um, I think just like just to mention one recent uh, thing or two recent things uh, that are pointing a bit in the in the other direction is that like I think there a Colombian judge used ChatGPT once and it came out, and then also a lawyer recently used it. Yes, <laughs> and um, it hallucinated some some cases that yeah. he didn't check, um, or he checked but not not um, well enough. I think he didn't check. <laughs> he didn't at all. <laughs> yeah, and he he got reprimanded. I think right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I, I he, if I look at, uh, it was for a passenger in a flight that missed a flight or something like that. It's not a big deal, but uh, he filed the case and uh, and inside the case he asked so ChatGPT to 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 file to 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 write all the case, and uh, inside ChatGPT put cases that never exist. Hmm. But the lawyer didn't check, so the mm -hmm. judge checked and see that yeah. it, it's not real at all. So yeah, so again, AI are, is a tool, and mm. we have to use it as a tool. We don't have to use it like a, a coworker or like a, a lawyer directly. You know, it's always a tool. And uh, but to to answer to your question also, for the future of AI in the legal field, uh, clearly to draft a contract it can be great. If you want to 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 pass, um, yes, to, you will uh, improve the number, the, the time that you need to do to to write it. Uh, so it's it's great to to write documents, but you have to read it and you have to to, to, to be very very careful. This is uh, this is uh, the tricky part because it can give you uh, great results, but you have to check. And uh, and for example, I, I know that some people are working on drafting patent application directly uh, with AI, so it's great also. But you again, you need to be very careful. And uh, at the end, because it will be very easy to say, okay, uh, draft me that. It's okay. I read it quite fast. And okay, and and like that. But it will not be perfect at all. And uh, and I know also that there was a company a few years ago already was working on a simulation of prosecution in front of the European Patent Office. So, for example, you have a, a notification, and you will say, "Okay, uh, I will answer that." And what will be the reaction of uh, the examiner of the Patent Office? And the AI is, has been trained on. This tons of data is able to say okay uh, based on that the, normally it will pass or it will not pass stuff like that so for sure it will be a very very valuable tool but again uh, a tool <laughs> Uh, just to to jump on what you said uh, Benjamin uh, and also Joel uh, 
what what I feel, you know, when I try to understand this world is that okay, you have this kind of AI that are that are access to kind of big massive uh, uh, database like OpenAI. You know, it's it's an exhaustive and unspecific kind of data they have they have everything that is written on the web uh the movie the and now the, the pictures etc so if you ask something about the law and you're yourself a lawyer or a judge or whatever you t you ask this kind of ie to, to, to answer a question he will dig it will dig um into this huge database that is specific and unspecific mixed you know so he can give you an answer but by tweaking some some uh, some codes in a movie, you know, uh, so yeah, you, you yeah. can't check. But what now? There are a lot of uh, legal tech, IE legal tech, that are popping. That that, that and they, they promise that their database is only based on 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 what is published by the judiciary systems. Mm -hmm. So, what is your thought about this kind of generalist IE and specific IE? Joel, sure. Yeah. Um... I think, like I, I, I don't know how they do it. Um, I assume they they do a retrieval first, so they I I assume that they search to uh, in their database first and then put it into the context, uh, so that the language model only uses this or or mainly uses this as input because it's so expensive to train your own model, especially if you want the capability of uh, ChatGPT. Um, so I, I expect they, they don't train their own models yet. So they probably work on top of uh, ChatGPT and then maybe yeah use use their data to make sure that ChatGPT doesn't hallucinate. Yes. Um, maybe they maybe they use some some custom prompts that um, yeah, yeah exactly that write out that work seem to work well. Yeah, because at the end when you you deal with a, a quite generic. Uh, AI model, the, the difference between the, the quality of the output will be your prompt and how you design your prompt. So indeed this is, but with a specific AI model, the prompt will be less important. But right mm -hmm. now, yes, with ChatGPT and then all these uh, legal tech, uh, the main work, they, what they are doing, it's selecting correctly the database mm -hmm. and then creating very high quality uh, prompt. Hmm. Fantastic. Uh, guys, we are reaching the end of this uh, this great uh, talk. Uh, Joel, what, what would be for you some uh, some expectation in the in the coming future about AI? How, how do you see the future, the fall of the humankind of a bright future or something between? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very difficult question as well. Um, I think the, what we will see more in the future is uh, that the language models can can use more context. So we see uh, Claude from a tropic uh, being able to handle a, th a hundred thousand tokens, I think. Um, and then another thing that we'll probably see more is the, that language models will be able to to be interoperable with tools so that they will be able to call APIs to use calculators, use databases and so on. And there, this is, this is where I see more dangers than, than in current systems, mm -hmm. like in current systems, as soon as they, as long as they just, they just generate some text. Um, I think the danger is not, not that great. Like it's, it always needs a human, um, so that, that the text comes out and um like even before we could we could write spam messages and phishing mails and so on it maybe it's a, a bit easier and and faster now but but we we have ways to to detect this when when we when the the language models are able to call apis um then of course you can try to design it safely um but as soon as the, the language models get get permissions um to execute stuff to execute random code, um, then yeah, you can just never be sure what what can happen, and yeah. um, that can can get they 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 get much more powerful. But obviously, as as uh, technologies get more powerful, they get also more dangerous. <laughs> Perfect. We have to be vigilant, Benjamin. Yeah. Um, yeah, 
Go ahead, yeah, please. I would say that um, we will need to improve our critical thinking and creativity because at the end, it's like fast food. Mm. <laughs> you see, chat GPT is, is less fast food. It's quite easy today to, to, to deliver food at home directly from your fingertips on your phone, puff, you get food. And then you will have to think about what you want to eat and, mm -hmm. and to do sports, to lose weight, stuff like that. And now we, we are doing the same in the intellectual world. We are able to get books written, poem, um, uh, songs, anything we want can be written directly and even uh, pictures and, and soon movies. So we need to be careful with that because otherwise we will lose completely our creativity and we have to improve our critical thinking because today it's not possible to know what is real and what is not real. I mean, my background is false. It's easy to know that, but maybe I, I don't have a mustache. And I, today I can do that, for example. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't know what is real or not. So critical thinking and creativity should be something that we, we will need to improve, to work on. Like we are wor doing workouts every day uh, for our body, we will need to do the same for the brain, I think. <laughs> I love your metaphor. It's it's great, and I will uh, I will steal it from it because I love this metaphor from the the, the food delivery. Of course, we, we can ask to to Uber to deliver us uh, fast food, but we can also uh, de make deliver us uh, organic uh, vegetables. But we yeah. have the choice, yes. and you're you're absolutely right. And with the, with these cognitive um, uh, tools that are becoming generalist, we can we can have access to many things to to the dumbest to the to the brightest. So it's up. To us to to decide where we're gonna go as a individual, but also as a species. Mm -hmm. So it was a great great talk. Thank you guys for being uh, today with me. Thank you Joel. Thank you Benjamin. Thank you Arim. Uh, Thank you Joel. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. See you soon, guys. See. Bye bye. Bye bye.